Amen. Amen. Take your Bibles, open them. Second Peter chapter three, as we finish off our study verse by verse through Second Peter. What a study it's been. And we leave off with a word that I want to present to you just to consider in your own life. And the word is passion. Passion. There's all sorts of definitions that we think of when we think of the word passion. But Webster's defines passion this way, intensity, overmastering feelings. It also uses the word conviction. Other words for passion include zeal, enthusiasm, and fervency. And as we end our study with Peter here in his second letter, I think of passion and you know, I say, that's what I want for my life. I, I want a passionate, zealous, enthusiastic relationship with Jesus. That's what I want for my life. That's what I want for you. I, I want us to remember how God has changed our lives. For many of us, we need to keep at the forefront where we came from. New creations in Christ, yes. And then it says, though, old things passed away. We can't ever forget. We don't dwell on it, but we can't ever forget the old things that have passed away. What God has delivered us from. The the miry clay. The the place of great depth of darkness. The, The Bible says that he's delivered us from the power of darkness and literally transformed us and transferred us into the kingdom of light. I want a faith that overmasters my my flesh, that fills me with conviction and a zeal for the lost. I don't want to be easily sidetracked. I don't want to be taken off track by people, by, by situations, by causes, by feelings, by emotions. I look back at my own life and I think of you know, I have been a man, you know, it's a man that could be described as uh, with intensity and, and focus. And I look back on my past and I've, I've lived with a passion most of my life. The problem is early on, the passion and zeal in my life was spent and wasted on this world. It was spent and wasted on myself. It was spent and wasted in a, in to the end point of where it brought, brought a lot of pain and emptiness, not only into my life, but the people that loved me. And a passionate life that's invested in the kingdom of God will bring out, well, unfortunately, it'll bring out a disdain towards you. We don't expect that. We expect, pe- we, we, we expect a, res- uh, a respect for people that are serious about what they believe. We expect a, an honor for people that you know, really believe uh, what they say and live it out. But in this world, This world is in hostile opposition to the things of God. I don't know any other way to put that. And it's much broader than you might even think. There is a hostility to the gospel of Jesus Christ in this world and in this world system. Primarily because the world hates Jesus. And because Jesus is hated, the followers of Jesus will share in that hatred. Not, only, not everyone in your life will be happy that you're living for Jesus now. In my devos through the book of Acts, just even today I was reading chapter 7 about the life of Stephen. And here's Stephen, a faithful young man. I was chosen to be one of the table waiters. As we'll get to that soon enough. A faithful deacon. That's the Greek word that's used to describe those that were going to distribute things so that the apostles, the pastors of the church could dedicate themselves to prayer and the ministering of the word of God. And as they were doing that, these men were chosen to take care of the difficulties in the church and to take care of the distribution of the the welfare system and the, the things that were needed among the widows and all the things that were needed in the church. Stephen was a faithful young man and was given opportunity to share between before the religious rulers and he rehearsed for them their whole history. But, but they were upset with him. And they induced people, the Bible says in Acts 7, to lie about him. And, and then they had and to stir up the crowds against him. And then they had other people lie about him to the authorities. And it was after those two events that what we have, we find the authorities coming down on him. We find the authorities mistreating him. We find the authorities treating him very unfairly. What was his response? He gave them the word. And he spoke to them like, in, like, like the, the, the appearance of an angel. And they couldn't resist his wisdom. 
And they couldn't resist what he was teaching. And in between being treated poor, poorly and in between being treated really badly, he shares the gospel with them. And you get to the end of the chapter and what was the reward? They killed him. And you go, what? That, that's just not right. So unfair. How could God even use unfairness? How, how could God use such injustice? Okay, I'm going to give you a hint. Go ahead, come to Acts real quick. I want, to, I want you to see this. Some of you already know the answer to this, but you got to understand something. Uh, since I've already taken you there, let's go all the way. Acts chapter 7. We'll study this on a weekend in a couple years, but let me give it to you right now. Here we go. This is so amazing. Uh, it says in verse 54 now, 54. And you can read the whole chapter to pick up where I, what he taught, how they treated him. But in verse 54, here's the conclusion. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And you're like, okay, everybody gets saved, right? <laughs> Look at what they did. They acted like kids. They acted like babies. They gnashed that him with their teeth. I mean, who does that? When's the last time you had an adult human being gnash at you with their teeth? But babies do it all the time. <laughs> you know? And notice, here, here's, here's Stephen. He, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven. He saw the glory of God, Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, look, I see the heavens open, the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice and they stopped their ears. So they're gnashing at their teeth. They stopped their ears and look, they ran at him with one accord. They cast him out of the city and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named, what's his name? Saul. 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 In a couple chapters, you'll be introduced to this guy named Saul. We actually know him as Saul of Tarsus. Stephen, can God use injustice in your life? Can he use unfairness? There isn't anyone listening to me right now that hasn't experienced some injustice or unfairness. Some sin perpetrated upon them. I think of those of you here today that came from a broken home. I think of you, those of you that came here today from a broken marriage, from a broken life. Injustice is all around us because sin breaks and sin destroys. But it's not outside the will of God. Stephen, it's horrendous, it's horrific. But he engaged, he took uh, opportunity, he used the moment. Who would have thought? Who could have predicted that where they throw their cloaks when they're killing him would be at the feet of this guy named Saul? And I believe this was the moment of no return for Saul. I believe this event that he saw and heard with his own eyes and his own ears as he was standing there while they ran after Stephen, changed him forever. It, it it, he couldn't shake the testimony of Stephen in his life. And you say, Ed, but why, Pastor? Why is that so significant? Well, Saul of Tarsus, he becomes who we know now as Paul the Apostle. Paul's mentioned in our text tonight. Paul the Apostle is responsible for the greatest missionary journeys of all human history. This man that hated the church, that hated Christians, that was there at the stoning of Stephen, participating, I'm sure, through the whole thing, up, to, up until the stoning, here he is. Here he is, having to deal with injustice in his life, and he can't, he's watching all, and it transformed him, preparing him for the appearance of Jesus on the road to Damascus then in chapter nine of the book of Acts, which we also will study. So you too need to expect that things may not always go your way when you follow Christ, that it might get worse and harder. That's not unusual. That's normal Christian living. Family members might misunderstand you. Friends might not like the new you. False teachers will come and try to take advantage of you. They hear of your newfound faith and they now like, wow, that's someone that I can influence in an early stage. Mockers will come, Peter writes, 
to discourage you away. But the Bible says, Jesus will never leave you or forsake you. Or as we learn in John 14, he won't leave you orphans. You'll never be alone. Jesus is always with us. And so Peter writing as a pastor in 2 Peter and 1 Peter, he's writing to believers under great injustice. He's writing to believers on the run. Great unfairness. They're not feeling like it's unjust. It is. They're not feeling like it's wrong. It, it is. They're not feeling like they have to run. They are for their very lives. And Peter, writing as a pastor, as we've studied, is encouraging them in the faithfulness of God. So pick up with me in verse 13 where we left off there in chapter 3. It says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Our affections, church, should be on above, not here temporary on earth. It's all temporary. I know it's the fullness of our life in the moment, but it's all temporary. You think back at some of the trials and some of the pain and some of the depth and you thought it would never end, but here you are today. It's a little bit better. For some of you, it's a lot better. Why? Because it's a reminder of the temporariness of life. The healing power of Christ. Our affections should be upward. Notice verse 14, therefore, therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot or blemish. I love that in verse 14. Peter, you know, you you picture him as this real strong fisherman and one of the words he used the most in his letter is beloved. You know, you're the beloved of Christ too. You're loved. You're loved by God. You're loved by me as your pastor and your friend. You're loved by the, the, the folks that are, sitting around you. We may be still learning how to communicate that to you, how to, how to express that to you, but there is love in the house because the God of love indwells us. And it's okay if you start walking around instead of saying, hey, brother, hey, sister, just start addressing, hey, beloved. You're beloved. I mean, it might be an easy way to step into expressing, you know, I love you as a sister. I love you as a brother in the Lord. I mean, just receiving that, especially in the midst of trial, in the midst of difficulty. Peter, he says, therefore, beloved, since we're looking forward to these things, verse 14, you have a responsibility. Be diligent. Show effort. You can circle that word next to that word, right? Effort. Focused effort. Diligence. Focused effort. Be diligent. Be diligent. You have an expectation. Yes, along the way as we wait for the soon return of the Lord, our hearts are breaking over the destruction of sin, over the hardships, over the brokenness in this world, over the hopelessness. So many given over to their lusts and their desires. And as a result, so many are getting hurt. So many are being hurt because of sin. But you're looking at these things. You're looking forward to the new heaven and the new earth. So be diligent. Make up your mind. Be diligent. What? To be found by him, first of all, number one, in peace. This word peace literally means an absence of war. Where you're not arguing and you're not creating division. You're not asserting yourself and with a scorched earth attitude, just taking people out but rather live with peace, the peace of God, the peace with God, the peace that only comes from God. Be anxious for nothing, the Bible says. Paul writes, be anxious for nothing, but in all things by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your request be made known to God. That's Whenever you make requests be known to God, just understand that's relationship. When you talk to somebody, it says, that's your relationship. Make those requests be made known to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will what? Guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God is yours by faith. Be diligent. 
to be found in peace. Peace with God and peace with others. The Lord can come at any moment. And he doesn't want us caught up in things that are disruptive in the body of Christ. Notice, he says, without spot and blameless. This, in the Jewish mind, would bring up memories of what? The spotless lamb, the sacrifice. So now we have language that Peter's using in the midst of hardship, in the midst of difficulty, live in peace, personally, corporately, but also remember the spotless lamb, living sacrifice. Uh, Hold your place, turn over to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Such a beautiful passage of scripture reminding us of our role in the body of Christ and who we are in Christ. Notice Romans chapter 12. I love this. Right before he begins to speak about the spiritual gifts, he says, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy, this is right there in the beginning, verse one, I beg you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Peter says, without spot or blemish, holy, Paul comes and says, I'm putting them together, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Peter says it a little differently. He says, be found without spot or blemish. Be found without spot or blemish. The Lord will come at any moment. You don't want to be caught in a sinful lifestyle. You don't want to be caught in a position of neglect spiritually. You know, there are always those when we begin to talk about the holiness of God, when we begin to talk about the righteousness of God, there are always those, and perhaps some of you are maybe listening online right now, listening on the radio, you you come back and go, you know what, that's very legalistic, pastor. You can't tell me how to behave. You can't tell me what to do, all this holiness, and how, who's, what's the definition of holy and spot? And, And they get all the attitude because they have hidden sin in their life. That's really the essence of it. It's a response, it's a defensive response to the reality that God's will for your life is to be found peaceful without spot and blemish, abiding in Christ. You might say today, you know, Ed, well, my sin doesn't even bother me. It's not that big a deal. It's a small sin. What do you mean your sin doesn't bother you? Is your conscience not seared? Don't you care about the name of the Lord? Or how about this? You're living in sin right now? Are you even saved? Make your calling and election sure. Make your calling and election sure. And then the response is, well, Ed, you can't judge me. Don't question my heart. You don't know me. You're right. I don't know you. But I do know this. Jesus nowhere, anywhere, at any time, gives us permission to live a lifestyle of sin. He died. Sacrifice, he was tortured for the sin that you take so as common, the spots in your life, the blemishes. You know, spots and blemishes, if we look at it in an application, it's kind of like, well, you know, I've always been angry. Well, that's a pretty serious spot because the Bible says that the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. That's no, well, you know, I've always been that way. It's kind of my, how I was raised or, you know, it's kind of my personality. You know, I've always kind of uh, exaggerated a little bit No, actually, you're a liar. And it's a spot and a blemish in your life. It doesn't help the cause of Christ. It doesn't help God use your usefulness in God's hands. And you know, these things, these spots and blemishes, they get bigger and bigger when pressure's on. A lot's revealed in our lives. And God would use the trials and circumstances to reveal so that we might surrender. Such a great prayer request today. Reveal things so we might surrender, going deeper into a surrendered life, a living sacrifice. So many are eager, you might even hear it, see it on a bumper sticker, I'm willing to die for Christ. That's a noble desire. But in our lifetime thus far, none of us here in the Western church have been requested to die for our faith. 
It's not a desire of whether you would be willing to die for your faith. Right now, God is asking you, are you willing to live out your faith? Are you willing to pay the personal sacrificial cost to live out your faith? And know that your decisions to follow Christ will disrupt your life. They will disrupt your comfort. You can't have it both ways. You can't, you can't serve two masters, Jesus said, because you either love one or hate the other. You, you can't protect your comfort and ease and then passionately, zealously follow Christ. You can't have them both. You can't zealously look for the coming of the Lord and the new heavens and the new earth and then live with all these spots and blemishes in our lives. I, I look at the decisions I've made over the years, the work that God has done in my life, and I say, yeah, you know, if Jesus didn't come in my lifetime and I enter into heaven before the rapture, before the coming of the Lord, I would still be glad I lived the life I lived in Christ. I'd still be glad. You know, if I don't get to see the rapture and the Lord takes me home before that and I'm at the throne room of God, I'd be, I will be blessed to be in his presence. I'd be blessed the changes that God has made in my life. I'd be blessed to have been used to serve you and love you and teach you and visit you and pray for you to lay down my life continually for the life of the sheep. I mean, nothing like Jesus did. I haven't been crucified, but to grow in my surrendered life for the calling of God upon my life. But it's not for the calling, it's for the people. It's for the people that God has allowed me to serve. I, won't, I don't regret it. At times it's super hard. And at times I get in the flesh about the calling upon my life. Or I get in the flesh about, you know, sacrifice, whatever that might look like in my life. But God always brings me to repentance, reminding me what he's done for me. What he's done for me. It's not what I've done for you. It's what he's done for me. It's what he's allowed me to be a part of. It's what he delivered me from, what he saved me from. My story is your story, church. My story is your story. Together. Abiding in Christ, serving him. It's true. I wouldn't want the Lord to, I wouldn't want the Lord to come when I'm in the middle of some arguing with Marie. I'd want him to wait. I don't want him to come when I'm in the flesh. I want to enjoy his coming, man. Or I'm upset on I-25 or some little thing has made me impatient. I want the Lord, I want to, I want the Lord, I want to meet the Lord in the air when I'm looking up in the air saying, come Lord Jesus. That's what I want. I'm not in the middle of all my fleshly life. I want it to be in passion and zeal and enthusiasm. I want it to be where I'm teaching the word or where I'm singing a song or where I'm just so caught up in the goodness of God and the progressive growth. That's what Peter's saying here. I know it's hard, he says. That's his whole letter. I know it's hard. But beloved, look up. Beloved, look around. Beloved, look in. Stay close to him. Verse 15 now. It's back in 2 Peter. He says, An account that the long-suffering of the Lord is salvation. I love that because earlier he said that in verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish. Now, many of you already wrote a did a little line in your Bible and you wrote an arrow down from long-suffering in verse 9 to long-suffering in verse 15 because now he tells you that long-suffering is salvation. The patience of God leads to salvation. This is why God, the, the return of the, this is why he hasn't delivered you from your problem yet. This is why he hasn't come back for his church yet. That this is why things haven't worked out the way you want them yet, because the long-suffering of God, which is also your long-suffering, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. Some of your Bibles say long-suffering. It's for salvation. Your life matters to other people. Your testimony matters. Your, your life seeking to be without spot and blemish, it matters, it matters, it matters. It matters. And listen, until the Lord comes back, it's going to matter more. You're going to grow in your usefulness to the Lord. You're going to grow in your maturity for the Lord. You're going to grow in, in knowing that God is with you. And so he says that, understand this, make sure you account that long-suffering equals salvation. Don't forget about the lost. 
Don't forget about the lost. Why is he allowing all this happening? Salvation. Why hasn't he judged the world yet? Salvation. Why hasn't he taken out the... Salvation, salvation, salvation. You think how many times do we just need to put on our glasses of salvation and see people that are created in the image of God that are lost, that are lost. Then he says this, as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, and we know throughout Paul's writings, he says the same exact thing. I intertwined just quoting things to you, like from Galatians. Galatians, Paul wrote Galatians. He wrote Romans. He wrote Ephesians, Colossians. So look at what Peter has to say. This is so Peter too. He says in verse 16, as he wrote to us in all your, his epistles, speaking in them of the things in which are some things hard to understand, which to that we say, amen. Because I personally believe that Peter, or excuse me, that Paul wrote Hebrews and Hebrews had some really hard things to understand. Romans has some really hard things to understand. Let, let's just say it not only for Paul, but there are things in the Bible that are very hard to understand. So you are not a bad Christian. You're not a weak Christian. You're not an immature Christian. When you come up against something, you go, I just don't understand that. Some things are hard to understand. But here's the thing. When things that are hard to understand, th this is very important. Don't spend your whole life arguing and trying to figure out the things that are hard to understand. I would say this. If that's your motto and mode, buy a special notebook. And as you're reading through the Bible and you come against something, this is so hard to understand. This is, this is you know, all the scholars have been arguing about this for thousands of years. In that notebook, just right next to it, whatever it is, and then make that a prayer book so that you just start praying over the difficult. Because let me tell you this. As many things that are hard to understand in the Bible, most of the Bible is super easy to understand. And, and I'll tell you, I'll give you a, a real simple example. You know, people love to argue about the the sovereignty of God in relationship to the free will of man. And everybody likes to argue and come to some conclusion and some people do on extremes. But many times, people that like to argue about that stuff, they leap over a verse that's super easy to understand. Love your neighbor. Say, yeah, but I've got to understand the sovereignty of God. Okay, write that down in your notebook, pray over it. And then go back to a verse that's super easy to understand and love your neighbor. I don't want to love my neighbor. I want to figure out sovereignty. Okay, okay. Well, even more so, love your neighbor. Or, you know, simple verses. Be kind. I don't want to be kind. And I'm not associating it, people to that particular argument. This is anyone that likes to argue about things stumbling over the easier verses. Peter gave us an easy verse right now. Look up for the new heavens and the new earth. No, no, I've got to establish myself on this earth. Look up. No. Live without spot or blemish. No. I mean, Peter's saying some things that are easy to understand. And yet some things are hard. Challenging in the Bible. I'm grateful for the men and women that have gone before us that have studied these things and have helped us think through things. Even if we haven't come to a conclusion on certain matters. We want to hold down to the essentials of the faith. We want to hold down to the character and nature of God and salvation and relationship to him. Even Peter, let me come back to uh, 2 Peter for a moment. This is also an encouragement that even Peter, an apostle, struggled with things Paul wrote. And there were things that Paul wrote that he didn't quite understand. And you think about that. You know, we're not apostles. We'll never be apostles. We will never have three years personally with Jesus. That, that's not our role. But the guy that did, the guy that stands up on Pentecost and preaches 3,000 get saved, the guy that was inspired to write two letters in the Bible, the guy that fell and was restored, he had problems understanding Paul. If he had problems understanding Paul, you and I will have problems from time to time. We aren't going to know everything this side of eternity. We're not going to have everything perfect. We need to make room. We hold to the essentials, but we also have to make room in love for non-essentials. 
and just realize people come from different perspectives and we don't want to destroy somebody with an argument. We want to love somebody with the truth. As we struggle, we learn and we grow. But there's also something else that's here. Just a simple phrase. By the time Peter wrote his letter, by the time Peter wrote his letter in the mid-60s, first century, some of Paul's writings, Paul's writings were already accepted as inspired of God and authoritative for Christian life. This is important because when people argue about the Bible and don't trust the Bible, they go, oh, you know, some men in the three, four, five hundreds, King James, they have all kinds of things. They're the ones that made the Bible. Peter's saying right now, he's writing before the Bible's finished, before it's even finished, that the writings of Paul, we aren't told exactly which ones, but the writings of Paul are already accepted as authoritative for learning and life for the early church. This is just 30 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, and already Paul's writings are being accepted as authoritative. A great argument for those that assign the Bible to some later date, three, four, five hundreds, uh, that councils made it. No, they're already, you can see, they're already using the New Testament writings. They're already writing, and they're already accepting them as inspired and authoritative. He says, again, he says, because there are things hard to understand, notice, those who are untaught and unstable will twist to their own destruction in verse 17, as they do with all the scriptures. You, therefore, verse 17, beloved, since you know these things beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be the glory both now and forever. And that final word, amen, amen. But you, with all that's going on in your life right now, but you, with all that's going in the world, on in the world right now, but you, what's happening in your family right now, but you in your own personal struggles with sin and the flesh, you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Other people are twisting the scriptures. You grow in the grace. Uh, other people are untaught and untrained. You grow in the grace. What is Peter saying? He's saying what every writer of the Bible inspired by the Holy Spirit has said, directly or indirectly, keep your eyes on Jesus. Add too simple. Do the simple things regularly. Do the simple things regularly. Read your Bible every day. Pray. Again, get a notebook if you haven't already. Maybe use your tablet. Jot down maybe in a prayer journal things the Lord gives you in your devos. Things the Lord gives you in your prayer life. Create a prayer list. Praying for your loved ones. Praying for your church. Praying for your pastors. Praying for your parents. Praying for your children. Praying for your grandkids. Stay strong in the grace of God. Grow in God's grace, his unmerited, undeserved favor. What do you deserve? You don't want what you deserve. Grow in, it doesn't say grow in the judgment of God. <laughs> it says grow in the grace of God. And that grace just opens up this reservoir of appreciation and thankfulness. Grow in the grace of God. That's where your growth really is going to take place. It's not by a bunch of rules and regulations. Your growth is going to take place in the grace of God. We're going to grow as a church as we extend the grace of God. Oh, Ed, Ed, wait a minute. The grace of God, are you approving of sin? I mean, anybody that would ask that question missed the message 15 minutes ago. How can you approve of sin and at the same time teach not to have any spot or blemish in your life? No, of course not. The grace of God is never permission to sin. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Why? To deliver men and women from abounding sin. Abounding grace delivers from abounding sin. They're in opposition to one another. The deeper you are in the grace of God, the farther you are from a lifestyle of sin. Abounding grace deals with the abounding sin that is always seeking to take over our lives. It's so wonderful. God is not the God of all wrath or all judgment. He's the God of all grace. And that's where Peter commends him. He commends us to the grace of God and to his goodness. He warns you, 
Beloved, be careful. You know this. Spend your time, your energy, and your effort in the grace of God. Such a great way to end. Father, thank you for the letter of Peter, for the reminder that in tough times, we keep our eyes on you, growing in your grace, receiving of your love. I know, I, I just sense there's those among us right now that feel like they're making no progress. They feel like it's, maybe even use this illustration like, three steps forward and five steps back. But I commend to them to your grace. Maybe there's someone among us that is feeling like, what's the worst of Bible study? What's the big deal? They're being trained. Lord, give them that vision of training. and develop. Give them the application. Give them a hunger. It's the brother I was praying with today. Give them that hunger for your word and appetite for the things of you, Lord. And it is hard for us right now, and it is challenging, and there's so much going on. But we trust you, Lord. And it's not even as bad as it could be. It could be so much worse, like our brothers in Iraq or Iran or Afghanistan. It could be so much worse. But you, by your mercy, have held back. And by your grace, you have given. And so help us, God, to grow in your grace and in your knowledge. Let that be our banner and protect us as we get into Jude from false teaching and false teachers, internet guys and you know, people that are preying on the vulnerable. And, and they, maybe they even got a good reason or a good cause, but it's not the cause. We don't want to settle for secondary causes. We want to follow you and be all that you want us to be. So thank you, Lord, for the privilege of serving you and knowing you and loving you. In Jesus' name, amen.